Welcome, everybody. I'm super excited about today's guest, Mark Yusko. Now, in case you don't know Mark, he is the founder, CEO, and CIO of Morgan Creek Capital. And he is also the legend who told the hosts of CNBC's Fast Money to buy Bitcoin at $8,000 back in 2019. That, cra- <laughs> that clip still cracks me up. Alyssa Lee's face just like, like, just buy Bitcoin. Just no, buy Bitcoin. no, no. It was, it was such a great <laughs> moment, Mark. And, and you know what's, what's amazing about it is while we were on the show, I think it had fallen from like 10 grand to eight grand. And I'm only on the show for like six minutes. So it wasn't, it was a super dump. And I don't know the exact numbers, but but it did hit eight grand while we were there. And and she said, well, what should we do? And I said, buy it. And she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you'd always say it. You'd always say it. Like, yeah, I would. Buy it today. Buy it tomorrow. Buy it next week. Buy it next month. I don't mean buy it all right now. That's not the point. And, and, and it was funny because it took a long time for her and, and others in CM, at CNBC to kind of come around. I mean, Joe's come come all the way. But um, it was interesting because the point was, look, it's a diversifying asset. It's uncorrelated to stocks and bonds. It actually improves the Sharpe ratio of your overall portfolio when you add it, but not if you try to time it and add it all at once. It's about dollar cost averaging. And, and what I say all the time is the price I steal this line from John Burbank, famous, legendary hedge fund manager and friend of mine, is price is a liar. The price of Bitcoin is not the value of Bitcoin. The value of the Bitcoin network, which is the largest, most secure computing network in the history of mankind. And, and look, I'm prone to hyperbole, but that's not, that's not hyperbole. It's 1,500 times more powerful than the CERN supercomputer which is the next most powerful computer. And he says, well, what about quantum? Quantum won't be close to the power of the Bitcoin blockchain, the, the Bitcoin network. And that value of any network is definable, right? We can do a Metcalf's law curve and we can define the value of Bitcoin. And back when I said that in, in 2000, I think it was 2017 or 18, I think it was 2018. What the point was that, the fair value was 11, 12K. And if we fell to eight, and, and eventually we fell to six, right? And then we fell to three. So I was early, you know, euphemism for wrong, but it, I didn't say buy it all at once. I said buy it at eight and then buy more at six. And then really, and in fact, it was funny, I was back on CNBC December 5th, 2018. And we hit 3167, right? The absolute low. And Ken, the, the host, the, the, the you know, she's a nice, nice young, young woman. She's like, Well, you know, you said we should buy it. Like, yeah, and, and you should. In fact, yesterday we issued the Morgan Creek Digital Challenge, right? A Buffett style bet. Anyone in the world, take the other side, million dollar bet, each fund half, a million dollars to charity. We'll take Bitcoin. You take the S&P. Crickets. Mm-hmm. Crickets. We had actually had one guy who was willing to take it. And his son, he runs a big asset management firm. And his son was like, dad, no, no <laughs> way, no way. No, because if we win, we're supposed to win. If we lose, it's horrible. So no, we're not doing it. And uh, and we didn't do it. But no, nobody took it. And it's a good thing because, you know, from that point, Bitcoin's up a lot more than the S&P. Mm-hmm. But that's not the point. One Bitcoin still worth one Bitcoin. What's happened is not that Bitcoin got better. It's always been good since the day. This is the crazy thing. Since the day it was invented. Now, it actually wasn't invented on that day in January in, in 2009. Right? It had been worked on for a long time before. It's not a coincidence that it was released on that day, right? Right around the time of the chancellor announcing the second bailout for banks, which is the first image on the blockchain. That's not a coincidence, but it's it's always been great. It's been a better form of money because triple entry accounting is the future. And all these people say, oh, it's going to zero. You know, Peter Schiff and Nuriel and, and all these guys I'm like, are, are you joking? I mean, name a time, literally name a time when a techno- technological advance went back in the bottle. Air travel, like 
railroads, electricity. You know, I've been, I've been, I don't know, I've, I've been watching the prequels to Yellowstone and they're brutal, by the way. I mean, brutal. The body counts are huge and, and you know, the gratuitous violence and stuff. And the, the, the one I'm watching out of 1923, I have to skip over the whole Catholic church thing. As a good Catholic, I just can't even watch. I mean, I know we were horrible back then, but I can't even watch that segment. But there's this, this thing about they're pitching electricity's coming and they're going to be these machines <laughs> that do all these things. And, and it's funny because they, they get campy and they say things like, well, then what are we going to do? Like, will we just sit around and do nothing? And like, yeah, that's what we're talking about with AI and all this stuff. And like, <laughs> no, here's the thing. The most jobs in the history of mankind have been destroyed by technology over the last couple thousand years, right? Mm -hmm. But we also have the most jobs in the history of mankind today. True fact. And AI is going to destroy a lot of jobs, but it will create more than it destroys. And then look, yes, I, it's funny. I, I, um, I went back and watched, we watched uh, the uh, Mission Impossible, you know, the, the latest one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's this whole thing about this sentient uh, AI and that you, you know, you had to go to everything digital, I mean, analog, and you had to get off the grid and they were typing stuff out to preserve it because the, the AI was going to chew up everything. Yeah, I guess that could happen. But, but at the end of the day, we'll survive it and we'll thrive and we'll create lots of new stuff. But the thing we won't create is better money. This is it. Bitcoin is better money and it's replacing the only money that's ever existed in the history of our world, right? Which is gold. 5,000 mm -hmm. years, 5,000 years, Lark, 5,000 years, a single ounce buys a fine person suit. The perfect store of value from Cleopatra to a suit of armor, right? I was just in Spain and saw all these big giant suits of armor in Seville, you know, which was the center of the universe and the conquistadors came over and discovered the new world. Quick fact that I didn't even think about, didn't know. Horse, pigs, cows, chickens, none of them were in the Americas until the mm -hmm. Spanish and the Portuguese came over here and settled. Tomato and potato, which we think of Irish and Italian, nope, South American. And it's just- The Columbia Exchange. Yeah, the Columbia Exchange. And yeah. the globalization thing is, is real and will be real, but, but money, because this is another thing I learned. So for years, I had talked about Money is an asset that exists in the absence of a liability. And there's only been one in the history of the world, and that's gold. We tried a couple other things, but gold is really the one. Everything else on top of it, right? Gold is the base layer of money. Everything on top of it is debt or currency. We use it as a medium of exchange, but it's not money. It's a currency and it's backed by debt. Gold is an asset that exists in the absence of a liability. And that gold was at the root of money and at the root of discovery of banking. And I always used to give the Medici's credit, but there was a little piece of the story that I just learned about on this vacation to Portugal. So I'd always told the story that the Medici's 800 years ago borrowed, AKA stole, right? Picasso said, good artists borrow, great artists steal. <laughs> stole this idea from these, these monks to do fractions or banking. And they and the Rothschilds and the Morgans have run that you know, cabal, not cabal, that, that uh, organization for all these years. Well, they said, no, 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 no. Those monks were the Knights Templar, the Order of Christ here in Portugal. And the reason mm. is they had all the gold from all the other knights who would go off on their expeditions and some of them didn't come back. They're like, what should we do with all this gold? Hey, Let's lend it to other people who want to go do something and we'll charge interest. And they invented fractional reserve banking. And then the Medici's borrowed it and created dual entry accounting. Because here, you know, here's the crazy thing. In the olden days, I lent you money, right? And I wrote down in the book, my book, I was the money lender. I wrote down in my book, Lark owes me a hundred bucks. And you come back to pay me, or Florence back then, and you come back to pay me 110. But I'm an unscrupulous guy, Lark, and I wrote down 200. And you're like, no, I only mm -hmm. borrowed 100. Mm -hmm. It says right here in the book. 
you had to yep. trust me and I'm just not worth worth your trust. So you were, you were out of luck. So the Medici said, no, 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 Lark, you keep a book. Mark, you keep a book. And we, the benevolent Medicis, for a small fee, will make sure that the books match. But here's the problem. The Medicis were, were kind of dicey. And I would go to them and say, you know what? I'm going to change my book to 200. I'll give you half. So Lark pays 200. You get 50. I make 150. Done. Awesome. <laughs> so I could cook the books. And that had been going on for years, right? Here's a crazy stat. The fines paid by the global banking system, the fines paid, okay, equal the market cap of Bitcoin. <laughs> that's, that a crazy? Crazy num- that's a crazy that's number. That's a crazy number. That's a crazy stat. And that's for money laundering and stealing and spoofing and all the bad things they've done because it was a system built on trust. Mm-hmm. But trust can be violated. Mm-hmm. Well, now, and it frequently is. What and, if, and it frequently is. What well, what blockchain does, what Bitcoin does, it replaces trust with truth. And next year, 2024, and I've been talking about this for a long time, 2024 is when we finally make the breakthrough to the truth net. Right? We had the internet, which busted the monopoly of the you know state-owned media that had control of information. Because now we could access all information anywhere, anytime. Well, then the mobile net came along and, you know, these things came along and then commerce and media got disrupted because, I mean, and um, because now if I want the news, I don't have to wait for the New York Times to send a reporter to Buenos Aires to write a story. I can watch you know, a periscope on Twitter and see people stand in the rain chanting Mockery's name and know the dude's going to win. Mm-hmm. So it it changed all of, of that and, and disrupted that. Well, a triple entry accounting, right, which is what a blockchain is, disrupts the trust industry. We no longer have to pay the Medici's or the Morgan's or the Rothschild's to make sure that the ledgers match because we have a third ledger that says Mark lent Lark $100. And I can't go change it. You can't go change it. Mm -hmm. It is permanent, immutable truth. And truth beats trust because trust costs us 7 trillion with a T, right? Remember, 1 trillion is a dollar a second for 31,710 years. It's a lot of money. So seven of those babies every single year get spent. Banks, brokerage, insurance companies, title companies, all of the trust industry. And you know what? They like it because that's their revenue. But now blockchain and Bitcoin in particular blows that up. And that six to 8% of GDP now gets liberated. Right. And in, in Portugal, I was on, you know, Avenida de Liberdad, right. Which is they were celebrating their liberty from Spain, but this liberates us from this 800 year old oppression from originally the Knights Templar and the Order of Christ through the Rothschild Medicis, then the Rothschilds and now the Morgans. And that's pretty cool. And that six to eight percent of GDP as it gets liberated, it will get reinvented and creators will create more and builders will build more. And we'll see things that weren't possible in the past because we had to spend so much money on this frictional cost of verifying trust. Anyway, I told you I don't do short well. Yeah, that's that's, the the first question. This is is, is super fast. This is super fascinating. Um, It's the history of money and the understanding of the why that we do what we do and why we have Bitcoin. And you understand a little bit about why bankers don't love Bitcoin or they're looking to the smart ones. The smart ones look at Bitcoin and know we need to get amongst this or we're going to get blockbustered. Oh, I Mark, wonder- it's, you know, you can judge the quality of an idea by the quality of its detractors, mm-hmm. right? If a bunch of people you've never heard of and don't really care about hate something, it's not a very good idea. When some of the most powerful people in the world, like Jamie Dimon was at WEF earlier this year in February, and he got up and he had his 10 minutes on CNBC. And what do you talk about? Bitcoin. It's a fraud. It's a Ponzi. And we said, oh, he's such an idiot. He's such a jerk. I said, guys celebrate baby one of the most powerful people in the world there is no debating that the president of jp morgan bank 
is one of the most powerful people in the world. That's not debatable. Mm -hmm. Okay. The fact that he had his 10 minutes could have talked about anything he wanted. He could have talked about the weather. He could have talked about the food at Davos. He could have talked about the plan to get rid of all the population. You know, could have talked about anything, but he didn't. He talked about Bitcoin. Why? To your point, exactly to your point, because he's jawboning. Oh, it's horrible. Oh, it's horrible. All behind the scenes, he's got a team, right? Making sure that when the CBDC is released, he's the one processing it not BlockFi, not Celsius, not Voyager, which were on a path to completely disrupt the big four. Mm -hmm. JP Morgan, Citi, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo were shaken in their boots as the assets were leaving their walls because they were paying zero interest. And at Celsius or BlockFi or Voyager, you could get six to 8%. Everybody says, oh, but they screwed up and they, yep, you know what? Celsius, Voyager, screwed up, Ponzi with the, their own token. Okay, that was stupid. That's like, that's like an algorithmic stable coin. It's an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist. BlockFi didn't do that. BlockFi didn't do that. Did they not have enough adult supervision in managing their loan book and they had too much exposure to FTX, which turned out are criminals, right? They're, they're, they're just criminals. BlockFi is a victim, not a perpetrator. They're a victim and there are other victims, but they were on a path to disrupting the depository institutions that we all hold dear mm -hmm. and guess what? They didn't like it. And so now there's a massive grab. And is it shocking to anybody that Larry Fink, after three years ago, when I was talking about buy Bitcoin, he was on TV saying, it's a Ponzi, it's a fraud. You should run away. You should be afraid of it. Now he goes on and says, you know, you should probably think about it because it's a good way to protect your assets against devaluation. Crazy. Oh my God. I mean, Larry Fink, man, come Larry on, BlackRock shilling Bitcoin. Not, 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 not a, a insignificant person. And look, you have a Josie behind you. I pulled mine out uh, from the other room and, and put it behind me. And she's amazing. I mean, truly amazing artist. And on my Josie there, on my Josie, it's background is Bolivar's. And I bought this as, as a, 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 she was raising money to help Venezuela. And I said, yeah, I'll contribute to that. And I got this cool thing. And, but what's amazing about it is those bolivars represent exactly what Larry was talking about. If you kept your money in the bank in Venezuela, you lost it all. Because the people at the top destroyed the currency. It's down 99.99999%. But if you converted it, to Bitcoin, because it was cool. If you shine an AR on that picture behind me, the boulevards turn into fire and Bitcoin is the background. It's so cool. And, and she made this like five years ago. I mean, it was totally, and the mask, she put the mask on, you can't see it. The, the face mask, she put that on before COVID. Like that was her thing before the COVID thing. So the virus was, was Bitcoin that was spreading because their mm -hmm. virus was positive. And I actually wrote a paper called The Virus is Spreading. Everybody yelled at me long before COVID. So, and Pomp was famous for that, that phrase because we worked on it together. But my point there is that what Larry's talking about is precisely what's happened throughout history. Governments devalue their currency to get out of debt. And every empire in the history of empires, from the Portuguese empire, Portugal, Little tiny Portugal, the size of Indiana, had the world reserve currency and was the most powerful place on the planet in the 1400s. How the hell did that happen? Because they had the best. Wild name. to think about. Wild yeah. to and think then about. Spain, they got Brazil. <laughs> Spain took them over. Well, then Brazil was part because a whole bunch of people went there. And that's why they speak Portuguese. And then a bunch of the Europeans went there. And but but the point is then Spain took them over. And then the Rothschilds created the first central bank and took over. I'm sorry, then France took over Spain. Then the Rothschilds, again, about the size of you know Nevada, took over uh, France and Napoleon. How the hell did that happen? Money. They could create money out of thin air because they created the first central bank. Then half the Rothschilds went to England, set up the Bank of England. And then they had the most powerful navy because they could print money out of thin air. And then we, in 1913, took a page out of that. And remember, the Fed 
which you know made their decision today. The Fed is neither federal nor has any reserves. It is a <laughs> private institution owned by European families and banks. And its Insane. sole job, its sole job is to enrich the bankers and the people at the top of the pyramid, the all seeing eye. That's its job. And here's the thing. Once you do the research on the nice Templar and the order of Christ, everywhere you look, there's that little cross. Everywhere you look in our money, in our mm -hmm. monuments, in the sidewalks, everywhere you look, there's the, I mean, on the ships of Portugal, everywhere you look. So it's been going on for a thousand years. And, and what Bitcoin does, it blows this whole thing up. And so people are really unhappy about that. And I get it. Like Venezuela, there has never been a bear market in Bitcoin in Venezuela. The price has only gone up. Why? Because again, one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. Bitcoin doesn't change. It doesn't grow. It doesn't get more efficient. It doesn't get better. It doesn't get worse. It just is. It's the perfect thing. But we price it not in Bitcoin. We price it in dollars, in yen, in euros, in bolivars, in Turkish lira. Never been a bear market in Turkey. Never been a bear market in Argentinian, peso, in Argentinian pesos. I had a friend just posting he was down there. And in the week he was down there, the peso went down 5%. In one week, insane. down 5%. So in that world where governments get over indebted and can't pay the debt back and they devalue their currency, that is a theft of yours and my wealth and everyone listening to this, of our wealth to the people at the top through this nonsense called inflation. We don't need inflation. From 1776 to 1913, a dollar was worth a dollar. Yeah, do you know why it's called a dollar? It was the no. right dollar in Holland where the Rothschilds were. And we said, oh, we'll just take the dollar. And that's why we called it a dollar because we were in bed with, with the Rothschilds like everybody else. And my favorite stat on that, the Rothschild family. Now it's a big ass family. There's a lot of Rothschilds in the world. Um, I probably shouldn't piss them off, but their <laughs> wealth, one family, their wealth is equal to the bottom 6 billion people on the planet. Unreal. But that's the, power, that's the power of owning the money. Of course, owning the money. And now everyone listening to this can own their own money. We can be self-sovereign banks. And people are like, no, I, I don't want to do that. Like, well, of course you want to do that. Not with all your money, because we still have to function in the, in the places we choose to live, at least mm -hmm. for now. And, you know, we want to spend in fiat and buy in fiat, but for the core of our wealth, we should have it in this asset that appreciates as other assets devalue. Just simple. I, I want to get your thoughts on the BlackRock Bitcoin ETF. Do you think <laughs> it's a positive or I know, right? It's a big topic. Is it a positive or a negative for Bitcoin? Huge positive. Do you think, and do huge you think they're going to get past? No, huge positive, right? It's, it's the antithesis of the huge negative that happened on November 6th, 2021, the exact peak of the Bitcoin uh, previous cycle. Why was that the exact peak? Because they didn't approve a spot ETF, which would increase demand for actual Bitcoin. They approved a futures ETF. Now, why is that important? Because that allows the banks to go naked short. In every commodity in history, oil, gold, silver, wheat, anything in history, when there's just a commodity market, like the good old days of oil. I produce oil. You need oil to power your machines. If I want to sell you oil, Lark, I actually have to have the oil to deliver to you. I have to put on a tanker truck and send it to you. Oh, no, 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 no. The CBOE came along. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, the COB, the, the um, board BO. BOT, Board of Trade, CBOT, Chicago Board of Trade, came along and said, no, we have these cool things called futures contracts. So, Mark, you just promise to get some oil to sell to Lark in the future. But if we settle up before the actual date, I never have to get the physical commodity. So there's no increased demand for the commodity. <laughs> there's only an increase for paper. And so what happens is the paper goes up and the physical supply stays the same, mm -hmm. well, that's bad for price because there's more supply, so the price falls. And so we saw this with gold. The gold ETF 
would not be approved, would not be approved, would not be approved. And despite all the evidence that the economy was rocking and the baby boomers were buying stuff, gold was stuck at 400 bucks. It was just stuck at 400 bucks. And then literally they approved the ETF. Why? Well, because JP Morgan was short all the gold they needed to be short. JP Morgan's been spoofing the price of gold forever. They make $20 billion a year. They pay a billion dollars. This is crazy. They pay a billion dollar fine. You can look it up. Last year, they paid $960 million fine for cheating, spoofing in the gold market. And they're like, yeah, whatever. That's 5%. That's like the cost of doing business. If I could pay a billion to make 20, I would sign up for that a hundred times out of a hundred. So the same thing happened with gold. Once they approved the gold TDF, where's gold today? 1900 bucks. Boom, straight up because demand goes up. So what happened when they approved the futures ETF for Bitcoin? Went straight down, 77% peak to trough. It was like, what the hell? Because people are shorting it because you can just go naked short writing a contract. And these people have and the same thing happened in 2017. We got the of first course, CBO, CBOE the futures day. for Bitcoin. Mark, yep. to the day. Mm -hmm. it, and now it, it also was, <laughs> it was also the day of, it was a Bradley date. Now people are, what the hell is a Bradley date? There was this guy, uh, Donald Bradley, who uh, wrote a book about lunar cycles and lunar cycles control all of trading. I mean, this guy predicted the crash in 29. He predicted, and it was all based on this, this book that this guy wrote in the 1800s about the impact of solar and lunar cycles on crops. And it makes perfect sense, right? I mean, human beings, tides, we're all water-based, you know, humans. Uh, and we are impacted by these things. And we have, you know, fear and greed. Here's a crazy stat. If you bought on the new moon and sold on the full moon, so you were invested two weeks out of every month, you would have made 140 times more money over the last 100 years. What? That's good. No, 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 no. And, and you're like, Mark, that's bullshit. There, you're, you're, I, you've lost all credibility. Look it up. It's I, I, I don't doubt it, but it's crazy. No, no, no. It's, it's crazy. And it's so that day in 17 was this, this Bradley turn date and the release of the futures. And I actually tweeted about it, you know, the week before saying this is going to be ugly. And again, I, I'm not saying that I knew and I didn't get, I didn't get super short because, you know, you couldn't up until that date. But I did sell a lot. And we actually, when we raised our fund in 18, you know, we raised the fund in, in uh, June. We didn't buy any Bitcoin until April of 19. Mm -hmm. and, and we didn't buy the exact bottom at 3,200. So I'm not, I'm not, but we bought on average in the, in the high fours um, because we were waiting to see when the momentum would come back and when they approved a third uh, party custodian, right? Where you could have a, a qualified custodian. And that's what we needed to get more institutional adoption and ultimately the ETF, not the ETF, the uh, trust, GBTC. And that drove the, the big move in uh, that bull run after 19. And so if you think about where we are today, right? We are at this point where it's not shocking that you know, I said a few months ago that, uh, well, a, a year ago, I said that crypto winter ended on June 15th, 2021. Everybody said, oh, but you were wrong. Look about what happened with FTX. I said, yeah, I missed Hurricane Sam and I didn't, I didn't know that he was a fraud and all that good stuff. And so, yeah, we had a lower low around the unwinding of the fraud. But from a a supply and demand and a transactional perspective, I will, I'll still stay crypto winter ended June 15th. Crypto spring ended June 15th this year. Now it is a coincidence, total coincidence, that the day of the announcement of the BlackRock ETF was that same day. And that is literally the day of the last low, right? We had recovered from 15 to 30 something, and then we crashed back down. And that day, the 15th, we've been straight up since. And it's not a surprise because your question, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Of course it's a good thing because it will be approved. BlackRock 
is 475 and one. They've made 476 applications for ETFs. They've had 475 approved. This one's gonna get approved. Now, does you know Bitwise's and we're an investor or uh, Mun's and we're an investor, do they get theirs first because they were in line first? I'm gonna say no, and that sucks, but I'm gonna say there'll be some weird reason why BlackRock goes to the head of the line. Surprise. And, <laughs> I mean, it's just, just the way it is. And, um, you know, when you have 10 trillion in assets, you, you get special privileges. And, and this is a, look, the, Eric Balcunius, great analyst for Morningstar. Uh, I think he still works at Morningstar, but anyway, great, great guy on Twitter. Um, said, look, this unlocks a $30 trillion market. Thirty trillion dollars of of RIAs and and uh, brokerage firms that have been reticent to approve anything on their platform, an ETF they're going to have to. So thirty trillion bucks. Let's get one tenth of one percent. Mm -hmm. Thirty billion. Well, thirty billion on on six hundred billion. That's not much, Mark. That won't do anything. Ah, six hundred billion. It ain't six hundred billion. The free float. Is more like 100, 150, 30 on, on 150. That'll move the needle. And if we get 1% instead of 10 basis points, it's 300 billion. Mm -hmm. 300 billion on 150. That's a big ass number. And so, look, supply and demand is really simple. Microeconomics. 101, really simple. When demand goes up and supply is fixed, and I will argue supply is actually inversely proportional to price because people get more convinced that they want to hodl forever as the price rises and they don't panic. So if the price goes back to 50 or 60, I think there'll be less free float, not more. I don't think there's a lot of people out there that are going to be selling. I think what you see with the daily selling is just the same people buying and selling over and over. It's the bots mm -hmm. and the high frequency traders and, and Ken Griffin, you know, because he always has to make money. Probably the smartest guy I've ever met in my life. I mean, Ken is just super amazingly smart. But, uh, and the fact that he's doing an exchange. Yeah, that's probably not a big deal, right? It's probably something to pay attention to, right? Probably. I feel like people are trying to pick up pennies in front of a flood of money that's coming in. And that's what these ETFs are going to bring in. They're going to break the market open in a way that we haven't seen yet with Bitcoin. And I, I saw the other day, Kathy Wood from Ark Invest, she brought out her $1.5 million Bitcoin <sighs> price prediction. What do you think about that? And do you have any predictions well, of your own that I, you have to share? I, you have to admire her. Right, she's the queen of hyperbole. I think I'm a hyperbolic person, but she makes me seem conservative. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's like there's this guy Murray Stahl, who's this amazing manager. He runs uh, Horizon Kinetics in in New York, and he's easy, 15 years older than me, and I'm old, and um, and he's an early adopter, a big believer. And when he talks about Bitcoin, he makes me seem bearish. Like, wow, it's, just, it's hard to, because I'm pretty bullish. And I want to buy Bitcoin already after this conversation we've had. I'm going to go out and buy some after our chat. And Kathy, <laughs> Kathy is, she's the master or the mistress, whatever, of um, hyperbole, right? You know, the, her thing on, on you know, Tesla is going to $4,000. That's just a dumb statement. No, it almost happened. And I guess self-fulfilling prophecies are, are amazing, particularly in low float assets and cults and religions. And, and I use those words intentionally, but ah, it's not a cult, it's not a religion. You know, Tesla definitely is a religion. Bitcoin <laughs> has elements of religious fervor to it. Um, there's the believers and the non-believers and all this stuff. But the difference is Tesla makes cars. They make cars. They don't make software. They don't, you know, they, they make cars. And cars don't have high margins. They they just don't. And it's okay. They're perfectly good cars. But I mean, I have a Kia EV and I like it and I'll never get a Tesla. And 
So, you know, they've lost one customer, but um, people are going to buy Teslas, fine. But they're cars. Bitcoin's different. Bitcoin is better technology for money. And the base layer of money is a very, very valuable asset, right? The value of gold today is about closing in on 6 trillion. So that's a 10x from here uh, for Bitcoin. But then Murray says, well, yeah, but that's just the base layer of money. All the other crap we have, the currency is bad. It needs to be replaced with good. And the reverse Gresham's law, good money will crowd out bad. Total gold money supply is 86 trillion. That's a big, big number. Now, look, I, I, I agree with him in theory, but in practice, the governments are going to fight really, really hard to maintain control of their honeypot. And they really, like, our government officials, all 538 of them, love the fact that they can own parts of companies, that they vote to give money to Ukraine that ends up at companies that they own, that manufacture stuff to go mm. shoot off in, 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 in this war. That's an awesome gig. They ain't giving that up. And so, you know, the whole thing about the money went to Ukraine, then Ukraine gave it to FTX, FTX gave it to Alameda, Alameda gave it to a uh, shell company made by, owned by SBF, and then he gave it to candidates. In the old days, that was done with good old fashioned cash and it wasn't traceable. They put this on chain. I mean, it's just, Un, it's incomprehensible. Like if I wanted to influence you in the old days, you and I would meet at the park and I'd have a backpack and I'd put it down and I'd walk away and you're like, Mark, your backpack. I'm like, no, I just keep walking. And you look inside and it's full of cash and you're like, oh, I gotta do something nice for Mark. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I expected. Well, wasn't traceable, couldn't get caught, no big deal. Now, if I send you a transaction on, on, the, on chain, people can find it. I mean, it's like, I don't know. And somehow he's going to get off because he has friends in the right places, but it's, it's, it's crazy. It's bad. So you, governments aren't going to give that up. They're not going to give up their fiat. So I, I'm more like gold, dodo bird, Bitcoin replaces that base layer of money, but it's in every central bank. It's at the base layer of all fiat on top of it. That's a, that's a good asset. And that asset is more and more valuable because we don't price it in Bitcoin. We price it in fiat. And as mm -hmm. that fiat continues to, look, when I was growing up, I asked people this all the time, and you're too young, but I asked people, what was the lowest price you remember for a gallon of gas? Minus 33 cents. I remember it like it was yesterday. I right? Totem Lake in Kirkland, Washington, 33 cents, got my, you know, learning to drive. And I put gas in my car the other day and it was, you know, $4. It's the same gallon of gas. It didn't get better. It doesn't do anything. In fact, it's less good because there's ethanol in it now. So it's, it's not quite as good, but let's take that off the table. It's the same gallon of gas. It's not that the gas got better. It's the money got worse. Mm -hmm. And so candy bar, right? A Twix was a quarter. Now it's like two bucks or a Coke, 450. So that's not things getting better. That's the money getting worse. And so Bitcoin from 2020, right? Bitcoin is like 10,000 bucks. And they doubled the money supply in the United doubled. States. This it's is crazy. Insane. This is crazy. crazy. Stuff. 247 years as a republic, right? We're a republic, not a democracy. We're a republic. So 247 years and a democratic republic, but we're a republic. And uh, 244 of those years, we created half the money. And then in two years, we created the second half. So what should have Bitcoin done? It should have doubled. Huh, it kind of did that. And now it's gone up a little more because the Fed bailed out SVB and all these other things and increased the money supply again. It was like, oh, they're tightening, they're tightening. Mm -mm. They tightened interest rates, but look what they did with their balance sheet. It's going back up again. And so it's not a surprise that Bitcoin's up almost 100% this year because the money supply is increasing. And that's all the price of Bitcoin is. It's a reflection of the quality of the currency in which you denominate it. 
So if you denominate it in yen or euro or dollars or boulevards, they go down, it goes up. Great. And if the base layer of money, right, gold, $33 an ounce in 19... Uh, 31, when uh, four or five, no, 33, 1933, uh, when Executive Order 6102 was implemented. And I think this is interesting. It is not a coincidence, Lark, that Satoshi Nakamoto's birthday is 4575. That is not a coincidence because mm-hmm. 4533 was when Executive Order 6102 was created. And 1975, was when it was made legal to own gold again. So from 1933 to 1975, you were a criminal in the United States if you held gold. Tons of people held gold. They didn't turn it in. They didn't voluntarily give it to the government. They were criminals, but very few people were prosecuted. Now, here's the crazy thing. I have this friend, she has a daughter, and uh, she came up with this great theory on why there's 21 million Bitcoin. She says, well, Executive Order 6102, that's 21 and six zeros. Bam. I love mm. it. Because 21 million. Satoshi baked a lot of interesting number. stuff into Bitcoin, didn't he? When you really start to dig into the mathematics, the numbers behind it, there's some fascinating. Oh, it's uh, a great. Look, and the little having, nuggets of gold in there. The having absolute brilliance, absolute brilliance, because it guarantees price movement. People are like, what are you talking about? Think about it. If every four years you cut the having, the block rewards in half, the miners, the people that secure the network, are paid on block rewards. So their electricity and machines are roughly a fixed cost. If their revenue goes in half, they all go out of business unless the price rises. Well, as the price rises, what does that do? It attracts people to it. And if people are attracted to it, the number of people in the network goes up. Well, what happens when the number of people in the network goes up? The value of the network increases. What happens when the value of the network increases? More people want to be participate. And you get this Metcalf's law, Reed's law, kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, that's hard-coded into Bitcoin. It was mad genius. And that's, so as, as much as I'd love to believe it was a single person, I you know, don't, I'm probably in the, it was Hal and a couple others, um, you know, God rest his soul. And, and the other guy who passed away as well probably was one of the four, but um which is probably why that that wallet will never move because from what I understand, it was a multi-sig and you're just never going to get those signatures. Mm-hmm. Some guys but are gone and they're not coming back. They're not coming back. And and look, it was funny. Someone said, is it possible, right? It was the NSA or, or you know, Chinese government or, and you know, it's all just a, a clever scam to get people out of fiat into this other place so you could steal it all through the back door. And, and I'm really lucky. So one of my venture partners at Morgan Creek is Scott Stornetta. And anyone who's read the white paper will recognize that name. If you go to the last page and the footnotes, there are eight footnotes. Three of them have Scott's name. He and his partner invented blockchain cryptography. They, they literally invented uh, SHA-256. So pretty amazing. And I got to ask him. I said, so Scott, what, what do you think about this? He said, huh. Never really thought about it. No. <laughs> I was like, well, you didn't think about it very long. How, how can you say no? <laughs> and he says, well, because the way you're thinking about a back door isn't possible because of the air gap. Now, I said with Ethereum, different story. There could be a back door, but that's a story for another day. But it was just really interesting how, how even if this was, you know, some government agency and not, you know, just genius people. It's not this plan with a back door like at Google or Apple or all the other places that have a back door, Verizon or AT&T, where they get all our data. Um, they can't get our Bitcoin. So it is truly unseizable, uncensorable. And okay, now, if they come to your house with guns, you're giving up your seed phrase. You know, I had somebody say, um, I was doing a podcast, saying, I'll go to my grave. I'm like, no, you won't. No way. I, it's just because they won't put the, they won't put the gun at you. They'll mm-hmm. point it at your kids and your wife, and you're giving up the seed phrase. So, look, if we're going again, 1883, that's the way the law was. Bigger gun won, and 1923, still the way the law was. Today, thankfully, right, we actually have laws. 
And we don't have to worry about that very much. And I, it's the one thing about a bearer asset that I don't like. I mean, the one benefit to a bank, even though I, I, I get it, right? I gave up my money when I put it in the bank. It's now the bank's money. And everybody's like, no, 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 that's my money. Nope. It's the nope. bank's money. <laughs> it's the balance, bank's money. It's on their balance sheet. <clears throat> you have an IOU, and that IOU is money good most days. But if they wanted to, they don't have to honor it. Literally, they don't have to honor it. And I, I never forget the first time I tried to buy Bitcoin. Um, I was, you know, we we're investors in Coinbase, so I was doing it through Coinbase. And uh, uh, the Bank of America said 14 day hold. Like, what do you mean? Like, well, didn't you read the fine print? I'm like, of course I didn't read the fine print. Who asshole. reads the fine print? <laughs> like, like, really? And like, well, we can we can do that. I'm like, well, but I've been your customer for 25 years. You shouldn't do that. I'm like, yeah, but we can. And we don't like that you're doing this. I'm like, well, it's my money. And that's when the whole poof, light bulb goes mm. off. It, no, mm -hmm. no, no. They don't want you to do it. And look, Twitter's littered with people now. Bank accounts getting canceled because they're doing stuff that yep. you know pisses people off. And I look, that's why a portion of your wealth needs to be in Bitcoin. And I don't know, it's, it's funny to me because, well, one, because I'm old um, and people say to me, you know, why'd you give up this, this great career in, in the traditional world and, and come into this crazy cowboy stuff? I'm like, well, because I had to. Mm -hmm. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Yes. And I was skeptical at first. I mean, I didn't get it and I didn't do the work at first. But once I did the work, and it wasn't even that much. I mean, it was work, but it wasn't that much. It wasn't like getting a grad degree or something, but I had to do some work. And once I talked to the right people, and once I had the aha moment of what triple entry accounting really is and that it's replacing trust with truth, you can't unsee it and you can't not want to perpetuate it and you can't not want to help orange pill people and you can't not want everyone literally everyone to have a portion i'm not saying all and if, if you want to have all I, I probably wouldn't argue with you but everyone has to have a portion mm -hmm. they just have to mark this is i think that's a great spot to wrap up this conversation because this has been so interesting. I think we could do this for hours. I could, like, you know, like, I, I'm just like, I, yes, I Mark. You. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, did. I warned you that one, I love to talk and it's a gift from my mom. We called her yak yak face. She could talk to anyone, anywhere, any place about anything. And I love her for it. And I did get that. I like to talk, but, but also what I really love are these types of things where a really knowledgeable host asks really good questions because the questions are way more important than the answers. And the other thing is someone said, I was with Scott Melker once and he said, you know, the key is, is just get good guests and ask them a question and let them talk. Said, no, no, no. That makes a good podcast. But what makes a great one is when the host listens and asks a better follow-up question, which you did a number of times. And, and I think that's what makes these conversations special, but also what makes time just go like that. So right. we'll do it again. I hope everyone has enjoyed this conversation. Thank you, of course, everyone out there in YouTube land, on the podcast, on Twitter for listening to this chat. And of course, we're going to have to do this again one day, Mark. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.